Despite the colorful nature of Genshin's world, Tivat itself isn't for children. Genshin Impact's history hides vile stories of human experimentation, child endangerment, and even child extortion. If you've been following this channel, you would know a majority of the things on this list, either by mention or I've covered it before. But I just wanted to showcase this for those who are new and in a neat little video, a compilation of some sorts about the horror stories of Tivat. Also, I won't be covering theories for this video, but rather excerpts in Tivat's history that I find fascinating. Notorious Child Experiments in Mondstadt the first chapter of Genshin Impact's webtoon shows us the horrors of one of the Dora's experiments. A researcher under his branch named Dr. Krupp pioneered an experiment where children from across the Seven Nations were being taken to a mysterious underground facility known as Heresies to be tested in combat against a mysterious tentacle abomination. Speculated based on the text of the panel, over 139 children have been placed here to contend for their lives in the arena. However, what makes this experiment so vile is the way that the scientists regard the children. Dr. Krupp expresses fear that the recent experiment and Ton died faster than the previous ones. As punishment, the Tori threatens Krupp by saying that perhaps Krupp should be the test subject for his experiments instead. To which Krupp refutes and says that perhaps they can simply collect more wares from Mondstadt through the celebration of the Ludihar pastime. During a meeting with Kaya, Diluc, and Seamus, the Fatui leverage their connections and blackmail against the Order of Favonius to gain more wares for their project. We, the Fatui, are hoping to expand our own ranks. We are committed to the defense of these lands. Your people can easily secure great honor by becoming one of us. We seek those who have faith in the Seven, not those strong in flesh or mind. Mond has plenty of faithful youths. Those we recruit from your city will be trained with the Fatui to become heroes in their own right. Kaya shuts down Krupp's offer by saying that the Fatui were essentially asking them to pay taxes with the blood of their children. The Higgy Village Sacrifices The Higgy Village Sacrifices are from a series of world quests around an individual named Washisu, an individual we meet praying at a mysterious shrine to an unknown god. When we first meet Washizu, it's through talking to him for four separate days. He is displeased with the disturbance caused by words of the town, which drown out the wisdom of the words of the heart. Neither the fools in Sangunomiya nor the madmen of Narokami Island understand it. So all they know is to fight each other and let the blood blind their eyes. The woman is like the Kitsune demons of legends. I let her go. He is very angry. This is my sin. Please forgive me. I will sacrifice again. At which he begins to go mad and attack the traveler, saying that they shall be sacrificed to his god. As we end Washizu, we finally get a chance to look deeper into the history of Hege Village and what had happened. Hege Village was one of the Inazuman villages that suffered the worst alongside the conflicts between the Watatsumi army and the forces from Narukami. Because of Hege Village's proximity to Tatarasuna and their technically neutral status, officers from the Shogun's army would often visit them to oversee the supply of crystal marrow for weaponry and armor. And due to the high exposure of Tataragami, the people slowly became sicker by the minute, dying to either the lack of food and medicine or through the crossfire in the war. Washizu, the village chief, tried to find ways to cure the people and help them in their plight, even relying on the pharmacist Naoko and her student Yasumoto. Washizu says in his journals that neither the Watatsumi army nor the Shogun's army actually care about the citizens of Hege village, only using them for promoting their leaflets and propaganda with empty words. Washizu laments that whatever happens, the shrine near the snake skeleton needs a dedicated person to maintain it. Everyone's frightened of the Tataragami, so he personally feels obliged to deal with it. He also mentions that Naoko's student, Yasumoto, is a fraud, because he ever only boils lavender melon with sugar, which has no medicinal properties whatsoever. Though it wasn't Yasumoto's intention to be a quack doctor, considering he had no real way of treating something as divine as Tataragami, Washizu and his people were still dealing with the after effects, and it was taking a toll on the mental well-being of the chief. Washizu began to slowly hear voices calling to him, 
a god of some sort that he addressed as him. Slowly, Washisu began sacrificing the remaining villagers to this mysterious god, believing that by appeasing it, he will be saved. He keeps a record of those who have passed away in the residential register. The register was written before his slow descent, and it first begins with records of those who passed during the illness, until the names start becoming more muddled. Nameless Passerby A. Sacrifice. Ungozaemon. 30 years old. Sacrificed. Yamada. 23 years old. Sacrificed. Senshiro. 4 years old. Returned to oneness. Senshiro's mother. Around 25 years old. Returned to oneness. Akiharu. 23 years old. Summoned. The possessions of the aforementioned people shall be left here as a lure, all the better to provide living sacrifices for his return. Choji's mother, around 32 years old, missing, he is pleased with her, and thus must be found. Nameless outlander, seemingly young, about to take the bait. The history of Wu Wang Hill has been uncovered extensively in many historical records of Liyue, from exorcist data to missing persons reports to funeral home documents. Wu Wang Hill's folklore is extensively recorded in the records of Jueyun. Hiding between the jagged peaks in the north of Mount Qingzi is a slope known as Wu Wang Hill, a palpably ominous place at the setting of many tales of supernatural phenomena. It is rumored by Liyue that the spirits of the dead lurk within the woods of Wu Wang Hill. They roam the perimeter of the decrepit village, wandering among the withering trees and rotting foliage, eternally yearning for things left unresolved in living years. These floating spirits often entice unsuspecting passerbys away from the main path and onto treacherous mountain tracks that leads them tumbling into a river or straight into an ambush of ravenous monsters. It is from this phenomenon from which Wuwang Hill derives its name. Wuwang means prudence in the common tongue, and Wuwang Hill is said to be the hill where the prudent are punished. For even those travelers who do not act rashly or impulsively on their journey are doomed to be ensnared by the malevolence that lingers here like the mist in the mountain air. Both innocent villagers and ignorant visitors alike are susceptible to the deception of the Wuwang Hill spirits which draw them deep into dark woods where thick mist blots out the sky and unknown dangers lurk in the shadows. There are many means by which these sinister spirits are able to deceive mortals. Some take the form of bereavement or grief, others of regret, manifesting as voices and visages of the diseased, the love of the departed, or the remorse of another party in an unresolved dispute. The traveler finds themselves compelled to heed the spirit's cry and follows them into the depths of Wu Wang. But Wu Wang Hill was not always this way. Some signs of life remained there up until relatively recently. The village at the foot of the slope enjoyed a peaceful and leisurely existence. The chimneys always smoking and the lanterns always lit. That same village stands abandoned today. The buildings are in ruins and all that remains of the villagers is the indistinct murmuring from a realm beyond. There is a fable that is oft repeated among the children of Qingzi village. It holds that the young people of Wuwang Hill, enchanted by the whale-like song of a faraway sea monster, all threw themselves into the gently flowing Baishui River in pursuit of false promises and childlike dreams. Along the river they floated making their way to the sea of clouds, where they become one with the waves and lost all memory of the woods and their village on the hill. Their dreams, meanwhile, became the sea monster's song. Generation after generation of young people disappeared in this way, until in the end, the sole remaining residents of Wuwang Hill were old and gray. If you have ever dove deep in the waves of Enkanamiya, you would remember the history of its previous civilization before the coming of Orobashi, the civilization of the Dainichi Mikoshi and the Sun Children. After Abaraku received divine assistance from Isteroth to create the Dainichi Mikoshi, a cabal of corrupt nobles came into power by establishing a false authoritarian under the guidance of Sun Children and the devout worship of the Dainichi Mikoshi as a god. 
the nobles brainwashed the civilians to believe that these sun children were handpicked by their savior to lead them, thus perpetuating a blind obedience from the people. However, the sun children were merely just that. Children. They weren't fit to rule, and the Dainichi Mikoshi was no god. It was simply a structure made to thwart the bathysmal bishops of terrorizing the citizens. And because the child was at the forefront of such rulership, they were the ones manipulated by the nobility to execute vile deeds and punish innocent civilians. The people's ire turned to the sun children, without many understanding that this was just a fault of parasitic noblemen behind them. As far as the people of Byakuyakoku were concerned, these children were just as sinful as their elders. They were ignorant of the horrible crimes they committed. Paimon argues that the children shouldn't be blamed, but that didn't matter. Because to maintain this facade of leadership, the nobles needed to make sure these children never grow up to question them. And when these children get to a specific age, rather than growing into maturity, they will be returned to the sun. The hollow sun child, their birthright begun, on Pegasus shall ride to the feast of the sun. They would be taken to the inner sanctum of the Dainichi Mikoshi, dressed up as those attending birthrights and in high spirits. The Legend of the Sea Ganoderma One of my personal favorite pieces of creepy lore hidden in Genshin is the ones hidden in the most obscure of places. And this is the legend of the Sea Ganoderma, a plant species that only grows in certain regions and islands of the ocean. Though it looks like a fungus of some sort, it actually comes from a substance secreted by certain soft-bodied organisms. In folk tales told in a certain land, these mouthless, noseless creatures are the transformed souls of children who died young. As a form of punishment, they must spend endless years absorbing the elements within the sand and sea, using their fragile bodies, piling them up, and forming sea ganoderma. And once the ganoderma are fully formed, they shall be harvested. It reminds me of those old folk tales that we had to listen to as a child, so that we don't get taken away at night and go home early. Except in Tevat's world, who knows if those folk tales are actually just that. Those that are willing to extort children have a very special place in hell. And this is one of those rare moments in Genshin where your choices really matter. The story of Benoit Leroy and his children is a desperate man's attempt at wealth through the vile selling of his family. Benoit Leroy is an old man who we first meet during the world quest, Leroy, Dying Fish. He appears as a frail old man that's cordial and kind to the traveler, asking for assistance with the housekeeper since he's been sickly the past few months. The traveler and Paimon assist him momentarily for the day by helping him around the house and accompanying him, and we get to meet one of the strangest signs ever in Genshin Impact that definitely tells you that this old man isn't as friendly as he first appears. We then find out that he is quite good friends with a young girl who lives close to them named Molly. Molly appreciates her little visits with Leroy, but admits that her parents disapprove of her meeting him. However, Leroy kindly does ask if she is going to keep visiting, to which Molly assures her that she will. The next day, the Traveler and Paimon also learn that Leroy had taken in a young woman and her husband named Morticia and Athos. However, Molly, the Traveler, and Paimon realize the strange behavior that Athos and Morticia seem to have around their father. Morticia is somewhat robotic and distant, while Athos insists that the three of them never meddle again in their family affairs. He offers to compensate them for their troubles, but he sternly tells them to not disturb them again in the future. However, none of the three actually follow Athos' words and continue to pry further in the matters. The next day, they return to the house and attempt to see Mr. Leroy again, much to the chagrin of Athos. Athos insists that his father is too ill to receive guests, but the traveler doesn't believe him, asking Athos why he is insistent in preventing them from seeing Benoit. Athos, angry and irritated, demanded to know why he should let completely unrelated people to see his father, especially in his father's ill state. Morticia soon comes along and asks what the matter is, and when she sees the three visitors, Morticia tells her father that he can see them because he gets along with them so well. Mr. Leroy meets the other three, yet assures them that he's simply resting up. Mr. Leroy assures them that his daughter and son-in-law are taking very good care of him, and that all is well. 
He sends the three off and returns back inside. Suspicious, Paimon and the Traveler begin to scour for more information about his history. And they begin to investigate the family history of the Leroy's. The next day, the two run into the newspaper boy named Pip. Pip tells them that it's weird Mr. Leroy isn't coming out to get his paper and wonders if Mr. Leroy returned to his old home in Flossandeu. This gives Paimon and the Traveler a new focus to investigate in, to which they uncover Mr. Leroy's history. They meet a man named Snodgrass who told them that Mr. Benoit Leroy was a scoundrel and destitute, selling flotsam and jetsam in his small stall in Flossandeu. Snodgrass scoffs, saying that Leroy was the kind of man who would do anything for wealth and power. Then, he adopted a young girl named Autumn, but when she was of age, he forced her to marry some rich old man for money. Her first husband, however, passed away after a few years, leaving the house to her. And what was Autumn's was Benoit's, which is why Mr. Leroy's wealth accumulated after the death of the man he sold his daughter off to. The second time, Mr. Leroy forced her to get married to someone else randomly just to get rid of her so the property would be his and his alone. When she was bullied and humiliated, he turned a blind eye to his daughter. And out of anger, she murdered her second husband. Autumn was hauled off to the fortress of Meripede for her crimes. Yet her one and only father didn't take the witness stand for her trial. Autumn stood no chance in the court. However, before her arrest, Autumn had trusted her only daughter to her father, the man that had sold her off twice and watched as she was around by so many people. Unfortunately, there was no new leaf to turn. Vinoy gave off Autumn's daughter to a random family so that he can use the money that would have been used for child support as his own. Understanding the full weight of the truth, the Traveler and Paimon returned to the court to confront Vinoy, Athos, and Morticia. It is soon revealed that Athos and Morticia, who was actually Autumn who had escaped from the fortress, planned to kill Benoit by pushing him off the cliff. They planned to disguise his death as a happy little accident, an elderly man on a walk with his two children, falling to his death by losing his footing on the side of the hill while being accosted by some thieves. However, due to the Traveler's intervention, Athos and Autumn's plans were delayed allowing Benoit to beg the Traveler for help as the couple leads their father back into the house. The Traveler and Paimon attempt to help Mr. Leroy escape from the couple by accompanying him to ride the Navia line out of town. Mr. Leroy is convinced that Autumn wants to kill him as revenge. Mr. Leroy, desperate, attempts to bargain with the Traveler, begging that even if Autumn gets the house back, then it is what it is because it was truly hers to begin with. But he wasn't willing to lose his life to that. He boards the Navia line aquabus, muttering that if he dies, he loses everything. The moment the bus stops, he bolts out in a frenzy, causing a chase between him and the Traveler. This leads Mr. Leroy to be caught by Athos, who was patiently waiting in the destination Mr. Leroy was headed to, a place that he used to go off into with his daughter. And now, as Athos uncovers the truth of Leroy selling off Autumn twice and leaving her to rot in the fortress, the Traveler is presented with two options. They can simply let them take care of it, sealing Mr. Leroy's fate entirely at the hands of Autumn and Athos, or intervene and save him. Regardless of what you choose, I still find the final conversation from Benoit to be the most disgusting of it all. What child of the Fleur Sans Deux was as lucky as you? The sweets you ate, your satin dresses, the novels you adored, all of those required money. While others shuddered and starved, you were wearing pretty dresses and putting necklaces on your dog. I gave you that life. So don't you think I should get some kind of reward? After all, there's no such thing as a free ride. Me? Cruel to you? I have been generous enough! What makes this even more disgusting is that Mr. Leroy does know where Autumn's daughter was, but he refuses to tell her, laughing maniacally that she will never ever find her. If you don't intervene, Autumn takes Mr. Leroy back into his home, to which the Traveler and Paimon begrudgingly say that this is none of their business. 
Not intervening also gives us the revelation to Autumn's daughter, and we find out that it was actually Molly. Mr. Leroy had been blackmailing Molly's parents to keeping quiet about the situation, and that her father had been trying to warn her that Mr. Leroy was a bad person. Autumn realizes that she was her daughter after seeing the resemblance and the age matching. However, Autumn decides against telling Molly the truth, saying that as long as she was happy and loved, and it doesn't matter and that she wouldn't cause trouble for Molly's current family. We continue this list with another case of child exploitation and the endangerment of young girls at the hands of noblemen with the story of Linny and Lynette. Lynette's story was unveiled to us in the Fontaine Arcad Quest and it showcases the sad underground workings of nobility in Fontaine. The pursuit of noble extravagance in a city of masquerades is a cruel temptress that poisons the mind of those in power and Lynette and Lenny's story shows that. As orphans, they roamed in the streets in search of food and cash to satisfy their hunger. By observing an older street performer, Lenny was able to pull together his tricks. They had been living off of their talents and ability to wow a crowd, until one day, a mysterious aristocrat came to Lenny and claimed that he wished to take them in both after watching Lenny's performances. Though at the time that seemed like a great deal, they soon realized that while they were called the aristocrat's foster children, they were nothing more than puppets to be used in the show. The aristocrat would take them to banquets to garner attention, which the aristocrat used to expand his social circles. However, after one particular performance, it was revealed that the aristocrat had sent over Lynette to one of the most powerful people in the banquets the twins were performing in. The aristocrat had sent her as a gift. Among Fontaine's nobility, there are also some novelty-seeking degenerates. During one party, a certain important person found themselves taken with Lynette's unusual appearance. Over her protests, despite her struggling, the sibling's foster father stuffed her into that person's carriage without a single thought, almost as if giving away a sofa-scratching cat. In her suffocating solitude, Lynette once again covered her ears in pain, unable to hold back the bitterness repressed over long years. When Arlequina found her, they found her in a den filled with other young girls, and it's almost horrifying to think what could have happened if neither Arlequina nor Lenny were there to intervene. One of my favorite pieces of dialogue in all of Genshin's lore is the mad ramblings of a man whose mind has been broken apart by a strange doctor's experiments. When I first read this in the World Quest, I couldn't help but be mesmerized with how horrifying the experiments done to them could have been. The Elazar hospital notes record a history of patients affected by Elazar. However, we soon uncover that these patients weren't being treated or healed, but rather studied and dissected. These subjects were being tested with several mysterious chemicals and specimens to either affect the subject's organs, maintain the circulation of some kind of fluid with their body, enhance or decrease the abnormally high quantities of elemental energies in their body, and weaponizing said elemental energy. These experiments are most likely the same experiments suffered by Kali when she was a child. The treatment that they were using to control the elemental content of a person's body without relying on elemental power is most likely Archon Residue. What I find even more horrifying is the implication that deceased subjects were being recycled throughout the process. We also then learn about a patient named Abbas, male, 23 years old. As we continue along the path searching for an exit, we then find the etchings of Abbas's final words as he descends into madness. Genshin's lore is filled with much more hidden horrors that lurk where we can't find them, and even now, as the story unfolds after years of questionable buildup, we've yet to actually uncover everything. I told you, this video is nothing more than a short compilation of what I found, but I'm sure people out there have also seen something much more horrifying. Even this video doesn't cover everything. The truth about visions, the sacrifice of Rue, the history of ancient civilizations. There's a lot more that I didn't cover. And with that, my name is Aster, and this is the dark side of Genshin Impact.